Welcome to Best Kept Secrets Travel, Episode 10. My name's Morgan. And I'm Will, and on today's episode, we're going to tell you everything we know about the National Trust. Best friends, and that's for life, who stay traveling. I'm talking worldwide, 65 countries between the two. Every moment is so unbelievable. Sharing the best kept secrets about the trips and mistakes they made that they can't forget. So tell me if you're ready for a time to remember as they gear up for the next adventure. Yeah. Woo! Best kept secrets travel. Before we get started on today's episode, Will, like we have not been filming for quite a while. Part of that's because... Good few weeks, good few weeks. Yeah, part of that's because I've had accounting exams, which so far have gone okay. You've passed. So yeah, they, they've gone okay. That counts. <laughs> and and y you've, you've hurt your eye. Yeah, so I had surgery just over two and a half weeks ago you now. You mean a nose job? You had a nose job? Yeah, yeah, um... <sighs> I'm basically an A-list celebrity now. I'm on Kylie Jenner level. I've had my nose done. Was it septo rhinoplasty? Is it lips is... next? I was thinking about some tits. I've seen yours and I thought I want some. And they are quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a septo rhinoplasty due to the fact that I'd broken it so many times towards the left. So some may say that other than Morgan and I, my nose is also a dromomaniac because it decided just to wander to the left-hand side of my face. But the surgery has now corrected and brought it back home. Um, it's gone and found itself on the left-hand side of my face on its gap year, which and lasted since I was 13. And it's come back and, and sort of back hurt in. your eye instead. Yeah, and now I've got this bruised, bruised, you know, black eye, and it was a lot worse around the surgery. Sadly, probably because of YouTube, we can't really show all the photos now. So if you want to go and follow our Instagram, which is going to pop up here, which is the BKS Travel on Instagram, then we will post one of the photos of me coming out of surgery just so you can see how it bowed it was originally. But I still look like I've gone 10 rounds with Donkey Kong at the moment. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm pretty sure you actually look worse. I know, I've got this bloodshot eye which still hasn't gone. Yeah, you just look worse. It, it, it was a waste of money. Ah, well, there we are. Anyway, moving on to the episode. We have the National Trust. We are very fortunate in the United Kingdom that we have the National Trust, which uh, looks after so much the UK, not just amazing places of nature and natural mm -hmm. beauty, but also collections of artwork, books, historic buildings of significance, all looked after by the National Trust, which is amazing. And during lockdown, a lot of people in the UK couldn't go abroad, couldn't necessarily have somewhere in there. They might not necessarily even have a garden. They might be living in a flat. Mm -hmm. and the National Trust played a key role in people getting outdoors spending time walking trying to help their mental health their physical health and really started to appreciate everything that we have around us and it just got completely overwhelmed I remember going to a few sites near us here yeah. such as Leith Hill and Box Hill and I've never in my whole life growing up in this whole area seen it so busy so today mm. Morgan and I have done some research on places which we've either been to or other places around the UK which we'd love to go and visit at some point in the near future nudge nudge you might see a mini series <laughs> on that coming where we might do a little bit of a pod vlog and we're just going to share with you everywhere where you should go if you haven't been to any national trust sites yet or you're looking for other ones to go to or even if you're actually looking to go on holiday this year because that's quite hard with COVID, travel being quite difficult and inconvenient and expensive. Now you can just travel around the UK and explore more of your own country. And we think that the National Trust and all their sites are a very good way to do that. And fairly cheap once you remember. And if you're traveling to the UK from abroad, when we completely open up and if all the restrictions allow for it, then we highly recommend not just basing your whole England holiday actually going around London, but going to places you know, like Snowdonia, going up to, I don't know, even throughout the Midlands to Scotland, Northern Ireland, anywhere on so South Coast, Lake District, just everywhere. National Trust is all over the UK, so don't worry about having to be in a specific area. They've got hundreds, if not thousands, sites over the UK, which we're going to mention Almost a few more facts. Thousands. Yeah, exactly. And, well... Well, let's go into it and let's talk about some of the background to the National Trust. So the National Trust are aiming to plant 20 million trees by 2030. 
And so far, they've raised £500,000 through their Plant a Tree campaign. And they've been able to plant the thousands of young saplings across the UK. They have also identified multiple other sites that they're going to plant trees. And they're aiming to plant a further 1.5 million trees over the next two years. One of the reasons we're telling you this at the beginning of this episode is because, as a lot of you should know by now, or if you're listening or watching us for the first time... Because we have mentioned it. ...is every time you go below this video, or if you're listening on podcast following us, and downloading or subscribing to this video, every 100 YouTube subscribers will plant a tree into the National Trust. And for every 50 downloads we get on podcast, then we're going to plant a tree in one of our favorite countries around the world. So far, we've already planted 20 trees. We've planted 10 trees across National Trust sites in the UK, planted a further five in the Amazon rainforest, and we planted five in Tanzania. And we're hoping that in the long-term future, we can get this up to a thousand trees, and if not, go far beyond that. I thought you said you wanted to plant 20 million trees in the National Trust. Maybe one day. If we get bigger than Mr. Beast, then 20 million trees it is. I'm not going to lie, I think Mr. Beast would struggle if, if, at National Trust cost. We can work out a discount. A discount. Yeah, maybe. bulk buy. Like Costco for trees <laughs> via the National Trust. <laughs> and moving on into further background about the National Trust. The National Trust for Places of Historic Interest or Natural Beauty, commonly known for short National Trust, is a charity and membership organisation for heritage conservation in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland have their own separate independent National Trust for Scotland. In 1895, the founders Octavia Hill, Robert Hunter and Hardwick Rawnsley pledged to preserve our historical and natural places. The aim was not only to save important sites, but to open them up for everyone to enjoy. And then the National Trust slogan is protecting nature, beauty, and history. I don't know why I feel like that needs to be like a really Scottish accent, just saying it. I nearly... <laughs> <laughs> Protect? No, I can't do it. Protecting history, nature, no, and nature. beauty. Nature, history. I'm Scottish and a literate. <laughs> so, I read it backwards. <laughs> you read it backwards. <laughs> the illiterate and Scottish are completely separate things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just illiterate. Yeah, you're illiterate. <laughs> As Europe's largest conservation charity, they look after nature, beauty, and history for the nation to enjoy. And it's all due to the millions of members, volunteers, and staff that support them. They look after miles of coastline, woodlands, countryside, and hundreds of historic buildings, gardens, and precious collections. In 1896, they bought their first building, which was Alfriston Clergy House in Sussex for £10, which in nowadays is only worth £600, which to me still seems really cheap. Yeah, don't, don't need a mortgage for that. No, no. <laughs> How many bedrooms is it? Uh, I can't see. Not sure. In 1899, Wick and Fen Nature Reserve became the first nature reserve, the National Trust's oldest nature reserve and England's most famous fen. And a fen, if you didn't know what it was, which, to be honest, I didn't when I first learned about this, a fen is a type of peat-accumulating wetland fed by mineral-rich ground or surface water. It is one of the main types of wetlands, along with marshes, swamps and bogs. Wiccan Fen is one of Europe's most important wetlands, home to over 9,000 recorded species, including many rare species of plants, birds and dragonflies. What does the National Trust own? Over 780 miles of coastline. More than 250,000 hectares of land. Over 500 historic houses, castles, parks and gardens. And nearly 1 million works of art. Wow. Wow. So the first place on our list of 20 different National Trust sites that we're going to talk about to all of you watching and listening today may this remind you of a certain film. A certain set of films, which actually we can't do the theme tune due to copyright, but it goes a little bit like na 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 copyright copyright. So, Morgan, 
So it's Henred Falls in South Wales, and it's one of the largest waterfalls in Wales, which plunging 90 feet... I don't know why I said feet first. Uh, sorry, apologies. 27 metres into a wooded gorge. Henred Falls is a spectacular sight, and it's surrounded by Greg Leck Woods, which is also a haven for wildlife. So it's very nice to sort of walk around and get a good hike in, see the wildlife and the falls. And yeah, that's why it's on our spot. Number two on our list for the National Trust sites today is... Carnado and Glidero in Wales. <laughs> Thank you for the pronunciation. Your Welsh is fantastic. Oh, never had such compliment from you, Organ. Glidero, a fairly rocky range with some grassy and boggy ground towards the village of Capel Crook. The landscape was shaped by glaciers during the last ice age around 10,000 years ago. And it was regarded as one of the finest examples of a glaciated land form in Britain today. According to Sir Ifor Williams, the word glider derives from the Welsh word gludair, meaning a heap of stones. If you're up for a proper dose of leg stretching, this 21,000 acre mountainous site acquired in 1951 from the Penryn estate is a walker and wildlife lover's paradise. The landscape includes Quinn Idwell National Nature Reserve, renowned for its geology and Arctic alpine plants, such as the rare snow lily. There are heaps of trails to choose from with eight tenanted upland farms and nine peaks over 3,000 feet, including the famous Triffin, which in some parts requires for you to use your hands to make it up to the top. It was here where Edward Hillary, who was the first to conquer the summit at Mount Everest in 1953, trained for his ascent. You'll hike past otters, wild grazing ponies, and water voles, with rare birds including ring oozles and twites often circling above. Whatever you do, come prepared. You need to be confident about tackling difficult terrain and having the right kit for those on a walking holiday. Make sure that you check the weather before you leave. Number three on our best kept secret National Trust locations is Kinver Edge and the Rock Houses in Staffordshire. Now this is a very unique location in Stourbridge, Worcester. Kinveredge Edge and the Rock Houses is a National Trust property in England. And they're basically deep orange, tiny sandstone homes that are perched on top of a hill overlooking the beautiful Midland countryside. They're several cosy cave-like houses and have been carefully restored to show a glimpse of what life used to be for many of the metal workers and their family who chose to live in the hills. And some have also been left just as caves, giving you an insight as to sort of the size and the space of what people used to live in and also just to see what it looked like now. The first record of people living in the rocks at Kimber date back to 1777. Just outside Kimber Edge, a place full of wilderness and accentuating the scents of the purple heather and gorse. Walk to the sandstone ridge and admire the sweeping views across the Iron Age hill fort. Once you have explored the rock houses, be sure to follow one of the many well-marked trails up to the Iron Age hill fort and take a pause to take in the dramatic views across the Midlands. There is no need to book to explore and many of the walking trails around Kimber Edge, but you do need to pre-book a time slot to visit the actual rock houses. There is plenty of parking at the bottom of Kimber Edge and there is a short, but it's fairly steep, walk up to the rock houses and you'll find a small cafe at the top with toilets as well, which is convenient. Number four of Best Kept Secrets National Trust locations for today is somewhere where I have been in Northern Ireland. Can you guess where it is, Morgan? A small causeway. Exactly. It's a giant's causeway in Northern Ireland. And I went there a couple of years ago and it's a fascinating site with just a couple of problems. It's one of the most beautiful, natural whatever you want to call it in the world it's volcanic rock forms yeah we'll go into detail about that part but it's just you take it in and it just feels so mysterious and everything and then you realize there's about three thousand people around you and it's hard to get a photo without anyone else in it unless you're going to be patient get there before sunrise or photoshop them out one of the best tips that I can give anyone in this, which is definitely a best kept secret for Giants Causeway. Hire an editor. 
not hire an editor is actually to go and stay at the hostel which is about 100 meters from the entrance of Giants Causeway go to the right of the visitor center and wait for it to open and then there's a tunnel which you can just walk straight through instead of having to pay for an audio guide or anything like that which everyone else does and it's a lovely walk down it's only a couple hundred meters and by doing that early in the morning I think it opens at something like 8 30 so it's not too bad you miss the initial rush because everyone else is having to travel about a minimum of 45 minutes to get there because the hostel is the closest place to the entrance. So where, where exactly is it? Like, is it in the middle of nowhere? It is right on the north coast, kind of in the middle of nowhere. There are a few villages close by, but the hostel has somehow become the closest place mm -hmm. to the whole center. Oh, wow. And we just stayed there via Airbnb and then walked there in the morning. Is there any other reasons to go to that area if you weren't that excited about seeing lots of people? So other than it becoming, you know, it's one of those things, if you're in Northern Ireland, you're in the area or you want to go and do a road trip around there, it is one of the things to go and see. Is it now I've been there, one of the things I'd go and see again? Probably not unless I was with someone who really desperately wanted to see it or I'm going for a really specific shot or anything like that. But other things in the area, you've got stuff like Bushmills Distillery, We've got another National Trust location not too far, which we're going to mention later. Ooh. So stay tuned. So, Giant's Causeway. Giant's Causeway is located in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. It's a natural structure with over 40,000 basalt columns creating a volcanic event. This has created what appear to be a series of steps leading from the cliff into the sea. You don't have to pay an entrance fee to enter this National Trust site, although there's a centre there which gladly accepts donations for preservation purposes. A truly magical place to visit when you next find yourself in Ireland. Number five on our list of National Trust sites to go and see, and we could do an entire list on Scotland, which we will do in the future. We are going to do probably a top ten video for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland for National Trust sites so that you can see all your places in a sort of closer area rather than we're jumping between countries but number five is Staffer Island. Staffer Island is a stunning National Trust attraction in Scotland. The rugged uninhabited Staffer Island is located in the Inner Hebrides. John Elliott Jr. gave it to the care of the National Trust for Scotland because it's different, in 1986. Although not large, it's filled with wonder and adventure. The most prominent features are the hexagonal basalt columns. I wonder where I've heard one of us talk about them before. And Fingal's Cave. These are some of the most spectacular geological sites you will see in Scotland. The cool hexagonal rock columns were formed millions of years ago by volcanic eruptions and look like the ones you would see in Ireland's Giant's Causeway. Time and erosion by the waves and nature created the acoustics, which are said to be inspired Mendelssohn's Hebrides Overture. Since it is only accessible by boats, rough seas and bad weather will limit when you can visit. Usually the best time to visit is late spring and summer. Most people visit Staffer on a day trip from Oban and usually combine it to visit the nearby islands such as Mull and Iona, such to combine it with a trip to Lunga which is the best place to see puffins in Scotland, which may or may not be on our list later, but Staffer Island is definitely a very fascinating place to visit. Morgan, are you a sheep lover? I don't know where this is going, so... Cause if three. You... Oh. Because <laughs> if you are number six on our best national trust site in this episode is Tatton Park in Cheshire. Located in the north of Nutsford in Cheshire lies Tatton Park, a popular heritage state in northwest. Tatton Park makes for a great day out as there are plenty of activities to do and areas to explore. You can spot deer and rare breeds of sheep in Ooh. the 1000 acre deer park. Stop by the animal farm which received an accreditation by the Rare Breed Survival Trust and make sure you do not miss out on Old Hall which is a secluded ancient monument and is featured on TV's Most Haunted series. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we do some of the things we do? Like sometimes... <laughs> it's our brains just connected. Go. Ooh. 
Make sure to explore the mansion, which features some of the world's finest art, furniture and book collections in the UK. I love furniture. Spend a good chunk of the day exploring the picturesque 50 acres of gardens featuring 19 unique areas. Picnic at the gardens or grab some delicious homemade food from the stable yard. The park is ideal for all age groups like families, couples, photographers, dog owners, horse owners and sheep lovers like Morgan. The best way to arrive at the car park is by looking at sat nav in the car, typing in WA16 6SG for the postcode or by biking along the Cheshire Cycleway. Number seven, Glenfinnan Monument and Viaducts. Seven! Glenfinnan Monument and its viaducts is one of the most popular and most visited National Trust attractions in Scotland. Glenfinnan is likely best known for its viaduct, unsurprisingly called the Glenfinnan Viaduct, which features in the Harry Potter franchise with the Hogwarts Express. Because of this, the area has become a huge tourist attraction in the summer months when there is a seemingly endless line of parked cars leading up to the entrance. So instead of a 5-10 to ten minute trek along the road, there is free National Trust, and this is the best kept secret, there is free National Trust parking located right next to it. But there is a lot more to the area than just the viaduct. On the opposite side of the road is Glenfinnan Monument, which overlooks the rather majestic waters of Loch Shiel and the surrounding Highland Hills. The monument itself, built back in 1815, is towering 18 metres high with a kilted highlander on top, and it serves as as a tribute to those who fought and died during the Jacobite cause. Your eyes already bloodshot. Yeah, I, I can feel it. I feel like we need light diffusers on these. I feel like they're meant for light diffusers. Yeah, I mean, there are. I've got light diffusers. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like these are actually bad for us. Yeah, 100%. It's taken a few years of my eyes. And number number eight, we have... Oh, no. Just before we go into number eight of our National Trust site, can I please remind everyone watching and listening to us today that it is quite hard to grow these kind of channels until we get everyone's support behind us. So if you're watching on YouTube, go below this video, click that notification bell because that's going to automatically subscribe you. Click that thumbs up in the video. And if you're listening to us on a podcast and it is safe to do so, please... Follow us and download every single episode because if you and four friends downloaded all the episodes available now, then together you'd plant a tree. That would be good, wouldn't it? And if you don't do that, then basically the tree doesn't exist because of you. That's sad. Yeah, don't make us sad. Right, number eight is somewhere Morgan and I have travelled together before. It is Penny Fan in Wales. In the Brecon Beacons. We have hiked up and it's one of the few places Morgan and I have ever been where the weather at the summit was not awful. Where we could actually see in the distance. Truly shocking. Everywhere else we've been has been awful. And Penny Fan was okay. Snowden, awful. Penny Fan, good. We could (laughs) see for miles. And it's absolutely beautiful. You see down on some of the natural lakes going through the valley. And... I 10 out of 10 recommend doing Penny Fan. I think it is one of the best National Trust sites I've actually been to in the UK. I think it, I think it's one of the most amazing hikes. You feel good when you get up there because there's that little bit of last steeper climb. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not too dangerous at all. Would you not put Giant's Falls way above it? No. 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 No, that was an easy no. Very easy no. When I've been at Penny Fan, there are about four people at the top. Probably not like that every day. And go giant schools around there are thousands of people every day. I'd put Penny Fan up there. That was a useless comment. Fair, fair enough. So Penny Fan is one of the most visited National Trust sites in the whole of Wales. One of the best things that you can do is hike the National Trust walking trail up Penny Fan. It is the highest peak in the Brecon Beacons at 886 metres above sea level. While there are four different ways to reach the top, the easiest route is 6.4 kilometre round trip, leaving from the post of Duff Car park. Luckily, the National Trust does a lot of work preventing erosion and maintaining the footpath. This is because Penny Fan's scenery is truly spectacular and as a result, attracts a large number of hikers every year. Arguably, it's one of the most popular walks that you can do in Wales and hikers who have climbed to the summit take a well-deserved picture with the Bronze Age Cairn. If you're blessed with good weather and a visit on a clear day, you can see dramatic views 
of the South and Mid Wales and the Southwest of England. However, the weather can change very quickly and it's recommended that you check the forecast carefully beforehand and do not leave the path at any time. Also, make sure you don't leave the path because when you leave the path in all these amazing locations, you actually have a massive chance not just to damage the vegetation, but damage the homes of the wildlife which is in these locations and some of them will be endangered species. After the hike, stay in the local market town of Brecon. Have a hearty pub meal to end your day and a cheeky pint. Makes sense. Always end the day with a pint. Unless you're driving. So don't always end, end on a pint. No, drink and drive. Number nine on our list for National Trust is St Agnes Head in Cornwall. It is one of Cornwall's most Instagram spots. And if you listened to a few episodes ago, I actually talk about when researching places to go, actually just type in most Instagrammed and then put in the place name. And it's a great way to research locations and actually find different places to go. And this is one of those places. It's a spectacular reminder of the country's industrial history. This is a walk like no other where the southwest coast path zigzags through heathland and past clifftop mines with the echoing rumble of the sea below and over to a secret cove-covered beach. Fans of BBC Poldark will recognise St Agnes Head as the backdrop for Nampara Valley. Whilst you're down and you're looking at St Agnes Head, I will highly recommend that you try and stay in the actual local fishing town of St Agnes. It's absolutely stunning. I've actually spent a week down in St Agnes before and I went out on different fishing trips all over Cornwall and it's an amazingly beautiful place to base yourself as you're directly in the cove and there's amazing surfing there as well. And I've even seen some of the French national team surfing there training That's when cool. a good swell comes what, in. It's really beautiful. This was quite a few years ago now. This okay. is... This was 12 years ago ah, when, when, I, when, I, when I was last fishing down there. But it is seriously beautiful and picturesque, so I do recommend anyone goes. But if you're not really into fishing and you're into surfing or hiking, the whole coastline in Cornwall is amazing to hike. B-E-A-U-D-F-O-L. Now for our halfway point in this episode at number 10 of our 20 places go and visit and see in our National Trust episode on Best Kept Secrets Travel is Kintel and Morvich. Out in the remote reaches of Scotland lies the beauty of Kintel. The scenery made up locks and glens that is highlighted by the stunning Five Sisters of Kintel. Located in the eastern highlands of Scotland area is the gateway out to the Isle of Skye. Kintel came under the care of the Scottish National Trust in 1944. There is plenty of history that can be found in the area. Sil Ferrachair is a 2000 year old standing stone and burial ground and nearby is the site of the Battle of Glenshill, part of the Jacobite Rebellion in 1719. The history of the area is fascinating but it's sheer beauty of Kintel that makes it such an exciting place to visit. The sharp peaks of the Five Sisters puncture the horizon and amongst the numerous glens is one of the tallest waterfalls in Scotland, the Falls of Glomach. The many trails that would lead through the mountains. You can also follow the numerous trails that will weave through the lots and glens in the area. Most of these trails are suitable for hikers and mountain bikers and horse riders. Other activities include kayaking and of course mountaineering. Kintel is a beautiful spot for photographers and artists alike and we do recommend going on social medias like Instagram to find the inspiration if you haven't got it yet or if you're struggling to find it. The vistas of the area are quintessential Scottish Highlands. The best way to reach Kintel is to fly and get to the train into Inverness. Best kept secret side note, has the largest pod of dolphins in the Northern Hemisphere with over 300 dolphins in that single pod. So we do recommend going and do this because not just going to Kintel and Morvik, along the way you'll experience amazing roads and sceneries. So the roads will feel like you're on the Grand Tour or in Top Gear. And I've driven a large section of it of myself all the way up past through Ullapool. And number 11 is somewhere that both of us have been together is Dartmoor National Park. Dartmoor National Park is the only national park in England where wild camping is permitted. And a night under the canvas is a fine way to get acquainted with Devon's mysterious moorlands. Wherever you pitch up, you will notice the park's defining landmarks with its tall granite outcrops rising over windswept grasses. Accessed by a long walk over boggy ground, it's a magnificently 
secluded spot for a night under the starry skies and check out any camping restrictions before you visit on dartmoor.gov.uk and we actually stayed at, upon one of the tallest hills which was a uh, Cosden hill and they actually had cairns at the top of Cosden hill and there were loads of rocks around which were probably from the cairns but we didn't move them. and they did the rock circles as well yeah. so that you would sit inside them so you'd be protected by the harsh wind that passes over Dartmoor. And we put our tent in the middle of that. And all I will say is Dartmoor is renowned for having really quick flash floods in the lower valleys. Mm -hmm. Really harsh weather which can come out of nowhere. So if you do plan on wild camping, do your research. You need to be safe. People do die every year mm -hmm. in Dartmoor. It's very easy to get lost for multiple days. So please take care with it. And make sure to pack your boat shoes. Exactly. I took boat shoes up. Best decision I ever made on a camping trip. I mean, to be fair, it's very comfy when you're sort of relaxing at the end of the day to have When you lop your shoes. hiking boots off and you know that you're going to still be warm enough, they're nice than flip-flops. Well, they don't get in mud long grass. Yeah, yeah, they that's, give me a that's, little, that's true. Down no, no, they I keep, wasn't giving you a little toosies all thinking... covered up. <laughs> <I> was... <laughs> Your that, these are covered up by the boat shoe. That's a Somerset, is it not? <laughs> Somerset. <laughs> the way you said Tozies was a very Somerset accent. Somerset. We might combine our wrists. <laughs> and your Tozies. In my Tozies. <laughs> In my boatsy Tozies. In your boatsy Tozies. <laughs> oh dear. Number 12 in Best Kept Secrets episode of the National Trust is West Africa. It's situated at the western end of Glen Affric National Scenic Area, a vast region of wild, rugged and remote landscape in the heart of Scotland, very close to Inverness, which means that if you're planning a trip to go either to West Africa or to Kintella Morvik, we highly recommend that you try and intertwine them into one trip because it's very rare that you're likely to find yourself up in the area and region of Inverness because it is very remote. Bare mountain crags and spongy moorlands make it the perfect long walking, hiking and climbing monroes and spotting wildlife. National Trust for Scotland bought West Africa in 1993 and has ever since then worked on restoring its wilderness. The entire area is full of scenic beauty and home to black grouse, golden eagles, red deers, mountain hares and water vaults. West Africa and in general, the entire Glen Affric is a slice of paradise and a best kept Scottish secret. There are plenty of well laid out walking and biking trails. West Africa also forms part of the Afric Kintel Way, a signposted cross country walking route that spans for 44 miles from Drumadrochic, <laughs> otherwise known as Loch Ness, <laughs> to Morvik, otherwise known as Kintel. At number 13, we have Lidford Gorge in Devon, the deepest river gorge in the southwest with a 30 meter high waterfall. The gorge is a great place for an adventure any time of year. The wildlife, river, plants and trees enchant the senses each and every day. Or from the river twisting and turning through the gorge for many thousands of years, there are some amazing features for you to find. There's the 30 meter white lady waterfall, and essentially there are lots of really interesting hikes that you can do in this area and easy trails for you to follow. Number 14, we have the Cheesy Gorge, otherwise known as Cheddar Gorge in Somerset. Cheddar Gorge boasts two fantastic caves, Cox's Cave and Goff's Cave. Cox's Cave is a multicolored grotto filled with sculptures, fountains and mirrored pools. A true feast the senses. Goff's Cave, on the other hand, is the UK's most impressive collection of stalactites and the former home of Cheddar Man. Both caves were, in fact, inspiration for J.R.R. Tolkien's books and, in particular, Helm's Deep. If it's good enough for Gandalf, it is good enough for me, Frodo. <laughs> Copyright. Yeah. yeah. No, not someone with a particular penchant for cheese, but Britain's oldest skeleton. Discovered in Goff's Cave, the Museum for Prehistory uses their most famous residents to teach everyone about how our ancestors survived the Ice Age. 
No trip to Cheddar Gorge would be complete without trying some cheddar from the UK's favourite cheese's birthplace. Real cheddar is made right here with unpasteurized milk and then matured in cloth. In fact, if you want the real deal, it also has to be matured in Cheddar Gorge itself. After all that cheese, you might want to walk it off. And where better than the cliff top George Walk after a three mile walk that takes the finest vistas across Somerset, you might be a little bit sleepy, but it's easy to forget all your worries as you wander the spectacular cliff tops. Wildlife lovers will be kept busy trying to spot a wide range of animals along the way. Please don't be too sleepy that you fall asleep at the top of the cliffs. That would be dangerous. Don't do that. Or don't sleep and drive. Don't do any of that. Stay safe. Which has just reminded me of driving in Australia. Really? <laughs> the the signs whilst driving where they had the trivia questions whilst that was on in the New motor- Zealand. Was that New Zealand? I yeah. swear that was just... either Don't way. Don't swear. <laughs> either way, that was really cool because we were driving long distances in apparently New Zealand. It was in New Zealand because we're going from north to south and there are those signs asking about the gold panning near Queenstown. Oh, yeah, yeah. And essentially, they actually had trivia questions on signposts as you drive down the motorway. And it was a fantastic thing to stay awake and get the brine, brine, get the brine working. The brine. <laughs> the brine. <laughs> get my accent out. Number 15 is Lundy Island in Devon. Although Lundy Island is maintained by the Landmark Trust, which is just another very cool trust, the National Trust plays a large part in ensuring Lundy Island continues to be an unspoiled haven for puffin and seal watching. Found off the coast of Devon, this tiny little island has just one small village, but an abundance of wildlife. It's super easy to get there by ferry from several Devonshire towns, Biddeford being one of them, and it's well worth the effort. As mentioned, Lundy Island offers fantastic walks and amazing scenery, as well as plenty of locations to spot puffins and seals in the warmer months. I also recommend buying one of the Lundy Island stamps. Yep, they do have their own stamps, and they're quite a unique souvenir to keep. Another thing is the National Trust actually has their own podcast. If you if you want to, we, we don't mind coming on it at some point, but they do an episode on the puffins in Lundy Island and it's quite an interesting watch and we may link it below. We may do. And by watch, I mean listen. We may do. Number 16 on Best Kept Secrets Travels. Places to visit in National Trust is Lynn Peninsula. Lynn Peninsula is known as Snowden's Arm. There's your arm. This is Lynn Peninsula for Snowden. And if you're listening on the podcast, Will was waving my arm around. Lynn Peninsula is a 30 mile stretch with stunning beaches, hidden coves, seaside villages, and rich with culture and heritage. The coast is also a protected area of outstanding natural beauty. Unsurprisingly, there's plenty of clean beaches peppered in this peninsula, making it a stunning beach holiday destination in the summer. While this part of Wales is still a popular tourist spot among locals, not many holiday makers make the visit for some reason. Lynn Peninsula is a truly special paradise for travellers with gorgeous beaches and family-friendly resorts. Visit Bardsey Island, also known as Isle of 20,000 Saints, which was part of the Welsh pilgrim route back centuries ago, and these saints were believed to be buried here. Bardsey Island is also a natural reserve and known for wildlife spotting and natural scenery. You can spot seals, dolphins, puffins, and as many as 350 species that are recorded to be seen on the island. A 20 minute ferry from Abadaran takes you to this Isle of Paradise. Number 17 on our list is Stackpole. Stackpole is yet another hidden gem in Pembrokeshire. Known for its award-winning sandy beaches, woodland walks and stunning freshwater lakes with adoring lilies, cliffs and a lot more. Due to its rich and diverse landscape, Stackpole also boasts a lot of incredible wildlife. It is also home to the largest colony of horseshoe bats. 
Stackpole Church dates back to the 13th century and remains to be one of the most well-preserved architecture in South Wales. When you're in Stackpole, it is impossible not to visit Bosherton Lakes and the Broadhaven Beach, both of which are widely popular among tourists, but still well worth the visit. Number 18 on National Trust Places visit is Killycranky in Perthshire. Taking in the mesmerising views from the footbridge that passes the River Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi. Near Killycranky, it's hard to imagine that this tranquil place in the Scottish Highlands is also the location of one of the bloodiest battles in Jacobite history. In 1689, Jacobite troops rose up against the government army and won this significant battle on the banks of the river. Even though the Jacobites won the Battle of Killycranky, nearly 800 lives were lost in the fight, including their leader, John Graham, Viscount of Dundee. The opposing government troops were hit even harder. One legendary tale of the battle tells of a British soldier who leapt 18 feet across the River Gary to escape from the Jacobite troops. Today, this spot is known as the Soldier's Leap, and it's just a short walk from Killycranky Visitor Centre where you can learn more about this historic battle. Killycranky is one of the most beautiful places spent autumn in Scotland. Then, the trees framing the river shine bright in all shades orange, red, yellow, and red squirrels mindlessly zoom from tree to tree <laughs> to prepare their winter larder. Stop at the Gary Bridge car park on the road B8019 and go for a wander along the river to see the iconic green swing bridge and watch enthusiastic daredevils jump off the bridge on a bungee cord. Or maybe you could be one of them. I'm still really trying to get you to bungee jump. I think I'm going to have to trick you into it one day. Trick me into a bungee jump? Yeah, you're blindfolded going skydiving with me. Huh? I think I'd know, because when I skydive, I didn't have someone wrap a rope around my ankles. Oh, no, no, we're tying you up for the skydive, because, uh, just in case you get scared. Just so I can bounce off the moving plane and up again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Number 19, and I'm going to let Will talk about it in a second, but Carricka Reed Rope Bridge. Carricka Reed Rope Bridge is a rope bridge, unsurprisingly, in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. It links the mainland to the tiny islands of Carricka Reed. It is suspended 30 metres above the rock below and 20 metres long. The National Trust do actually charge a small fee for crossing the bridge, which they don't do for a lot of their sites, but this is one of them. And they strongly recommend booking your crossing before arriving at the destination, as it does get very busy. Will has actually been there, so I'm going to ask him, did it get very busy? So it was very busy, and I think one of the reasons why they're making the charge is one, because then it will slightly reduce visitor numbers just to people who really desperately want to go. Price elasticity of demand. Exactly. On top of the fact that they're having a constant hiring permanently of staff during the day as well as due to sheer visitor numbers they have to also maintain the car park one of the other reasons why it's so busy is the fact that Carricka Reed Bridge is the place I was teasing you guys about earlier which is very close to Giants Causeway it is in the same county as Giants Causeway as well as being in the same county as many other National Trust sites so I do highly recommend you go and it was actually one of the favorite National Trust sites I've been to because you go across this Karakari rope bridge to this island which used to be an island used for salmon fishing so they used to lower the boats off the edge of the cliff and then go and fish out salmon and bring it back you do have a small chance to see puffins when i was there you actually saw a lot of seals out at sea and it's the most amazing thing i'm scared of heights but don't feel scared because the rope bridge is very well maintained and they oh. have repaired it over the years it's not the same original rope bridge that they once upon a time went across well i think it's still very cool to visit and now what we want our re readers the reading is probably the one thing that no one here no one is doing to get our contact no contact if you're watching or listening if you're watching or listening we want you to comment your favorite national trust site that we've mentioned and also your favorite national trust site that maybe we haven't mentioned and that you'd recommend us going to and will i think has a favorite my, national my trust favorite site. national trust site that i've grown up around it's only Giants causeway 
No. <laughs> no. Is only about a five, ten minute drive from where I have grown up and lived. No, you know where he lives. Is Box Hill. It's a very, very well known hill in the area due to its Size. TV. Well, it's not really TV debut because it's been on TV multiple times, but it played a significant role in the cycling road race in the 2012 Olympics in the UK. It's the most amazing hill. It's very popular with cyclists. Not if you're cycling up, it's really tiring. Yeah, it's miserable, <laughs> but it's popular with cyclists. It's popular with hikers. It's popular with cars. It's popular with motorcyclists. It's popular with everyone. I used to even go there when what I was kind of young with... I used to even go there when I was a tiny bit younger with school because they do these amazing educational tours and trips to teach kids and encourage them to be closer to nature and the wildlife. One of the other things that you guys should know about Box Hill, that if you're watching or listening today and you're a female and you go on a date with Morgan, chances are your first date is going to be going up Box Hill and then being taken to Denby's for a glass of wine. I've never taken anyone on a date there. I've just taken people who have visited there. You know who you are. And they can all say that they were on dates. Sure. One of the hikes you can do, you can start at the bottom and there's a car park down there and a pub for when you finish after called the Stepping Stone Pub. There are some stepping stones where you can cross the river and it's quite fun when the water's low on the river and there used to also be a rope swing over the river which i think there is still there somewhere they're not part of the national trust they are random people who have put them up there <laughs> yeah and if anything it damages the trees exactly and my dad actually broke his finger on the rope swing but anyway and a best kept secret for box hill if you are planning on hiking up one of these routes or you want to go somewhere afterwards and grab some food or maybe a glass of wine is if you go and park across the road in Denby's, the National Trust is allowed to borrow the car parking space over there so it's completely free. Whereas if you try and park at the top of Box Hill or at the bottom to go for walks, you will be charged. Best kept secret for Box Hill. For anyone wondering what I'm talking about, Denby's is the largest vineyard in the UK by landmass and the second largest by volume of wine produced every year and it's got the most amazing car park which lots of cyclists park out walkers and dog walkers or people just popping to the village shop which is a farm shop in Denby's and yes for any Parisian friends that I have out there who I did take there England does make wine we do, and Denbys have won a lot of awards with their wine. And also, if you're not a wine lover, but you're a beer lover, Denbys do rent out the side of their vineyard to Surrey Hills Brewery, which makes an amazing beer called Sheer Drop. So I highly recommend you go and try it. Morgan, out of all the sites that we've mentioned today, which you haven't been to, which one would you love to go to next? Ooh, now that pick is, one you have to pick one that and only is a good one question or and why why would you love to go and see it i think i'm going to say lundy island because i would love to go and see the puffins okay because i haven't seen puffins yet okay. and that is a that would be a new experience for me and i'm always looking to experience new things what about you for the sites that we haven't been to or you haven't been to? Ooh, haven't been to. Haven't been to. I should have said Giants Causeway, missed opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind going to Stackpole. I think that would be quite interesting seeing if it really is the largest colony of horseshoe bats. Hmm. I think that would be quite cool to go and see. Yeah. I mean, they're loud, and I want to see if they're the largest colony, just how extreme loud, that really yeah. is. And that is interesting that we've both sort of chosen sites based around the wildlife there. Yeah. There are many other places you can... I know that you can see puffins. You could go to the Skelligars in the Republic mm -hmm. of Ireland. You could go down to the Scilly Which Isles. Is Skelligars, is that not Star Wars? Skelligars were used for the Force scene awakens. where they find luke on the yeah. island yeah spoiler um, alert. <laughs> if that's a spoiler then i don't it's probably not, I no. zero sympathy that you've left at this song to watch <laughs> um and then the other place is you could go to the isles of silly mm -hmm. down 
off Cornish coast. You go out from somewhere like Penzance, go to the Isle of City, and you can go and see puffins down there as well. That would be very cool. So many also, other places as I mentioned before, I'd also like to get you bungee jumping at Killy Cranky. Yeah, that's not going to happen. If we get one million likes on this video... If we get one like on this video... Well, one million likes. One. He's, he's, he's not good with numbers. I don't know. I'll, I'll take 50,000 likes on this video, however long it takes. By the point of that happening, I'll go and do that bungee jump. Please help me out. This We, we would make so many videos and it would be so worth it. 50,000 likes and I'll do it. It would be so worth it. After talking about the National Trust, a lot of you might be wondering, how much does it actually cost to become a member? Well, I'm sure after watching this video, you now desperately want to become a member. And you should, because they look after the nature and beauty in this country. And there's not much left. So, Morgan, if you're an adult and you want a year membership to National Trust, how much does it cost? £72. And Morgan... If you are a young person aged between 18 and 25 years old, how much does it cost? 50% off at £36. And Morgan, if you are aged 0 to 17 years old, how much does it cost? A tenner. For anyone wondering what a tenner is, that is £10. If you are a National Trust member, you get free entry to the majority of their places. Brackets with pre-booking. Free Somewhere. parking at almost all of their car parks. Brackets with some pre-booking. National Trust Handbook. Full of information about their places. National Trust Magazine. Three times a year. Packed with inspiration, interviews and news access to our online members area. So I'd very much be hoping that uh, the next next National Trust Magazine, that we, we, we're on it for being think... inspirational. I think we should. And also, fun fact, National Trust also sometimes during the year will have special offers on where you can get bonus things. So, for example, I actually got a pair of binoculars. because they binoculars? They're... Yes, because they were doing a push on binos for bird watching. Fantastic. I know. So, you should watch out for them. And on top of all of this, if you are a dedicated National Trust or you are just going to be spontaneous and splash out on a large sum of money out of nowhere. For £1,730, you can become a lifetime member. I know if you are a couple, you can get a slight discount on this. So, Will, how would you find National Trust sites if you're in an area that you didn't know, or even around your area? Because you've, you've found a lot of nas new National Trust sites around this area quite recently. So when you get your National Trust membership, you get a booklet which has absolutely every single National Trust site in it. You also can go online completely free. You don't even need to have an account to sign in. And there is a drag and drop map of every National Trust Centre in the UK. So you have no excuse to not find one close to you. Quick quiz. Can you remember from the beginning of the episode how many hectares of land the National Trust owns? Time starts now. Beep, 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 beep. 250,000, otherwise known as 1% of the UK's land mass. For our viewers and listeners today, how many miles of coastline does the National Trust own in the UK? And time starts now. Beep, 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 beep. It's 780. Miles, Miles of coastline. Of coastline. <laughs> <laughs> As we come to the end of this episode, can Morgan and I remind you that we are trying to grow this channel both on our podcast and YouTube. And we would love you guys to ring that notification bell at the bottom to subscribe and click that like button on this video. And if you're listening on a podcast, please follow us and download every episode. You should do this because we are saving you money when you watch our cost episodes. We are teaching you about countries and deep diving into them, giving you the best kept secrets. You will also learn the best ways to plan your trips through our deep dives in cities and countries. And with every single episode we get out, you will get more best kept secrets on how to travel, which will include saving money, packing, different countries, different foods to try, or in some cases not to try. So if you go back to, I believe it was episode four, where we eat some pretty grim food. 
You can then laugh at us so you never have to. Or it might inspire you to try it with some friends at a party or something. Yeah, just give it to your mates. Yeah, just give it to your mates as a bit of a prank or a dare. That's what I did. (laughs) Exactly. So, please, like, subscribe, follow, ring that notification bell. And there's one more thing that we haven't mentioned, and I feel like we haven't actually spoken about this almost ever. What? When do our episodes go live? Wednesday at... 6 p.m. Roll the outro. Let's make it happen. I hope that you can handle uh, going on adventures. Best kept secret travels. Yeah, all over the globe. Having fun, you know the deal. Amazing secret locations. Hang out with Morgan and Will. Uh, educating, entertain, haggle in the market. Uh, sharing their experiences. Time to get it started. Let's go.